This episode features ultra-running legend and author Scott Jurek. Welcome to Wild Ideas Worth Living, an adventure podcast presented by REI Co-op, the brand who helps get you outside through gear, classes, and adventures. We talk to experts who have taken a wild idea and made it a reality so you can too. From people who have climbed the tallest peaks, started thriving businesses, and even broken records, some of the wildest ideas can lead to the most rewarding adventures. I'm your host, Shelby Stanger, and I hope you enjoy this show. Scott Jurek is one of the most accomplished ultra runners of all time. I first learned about him from our previous guest, Chris McDougall's book, Born to Run, but I've followed his amazing career ever since. Among his many achievements, Scott won the 153-mile Spartathlon, the Hard Rock 100, the Badwater 135-mile Ultra Marathon, and he's won the Western State's 100-mile endurance run a record seven straight times. He also wrote the New York Times bestseller, Eat and Run, which is a memoir chronicling his humble Midwestern childhood to his transition to ultra running, being a vegan, and all the records he's been breaking since. In 2015, when Scott could have easily retired, he set out on a grand adventure to run the entire Appalachian Trail north towards Maine, where he broke the trail speed record, averaging nearly 50 miles a day for over 46 days. He chronicled this adventure in his latest book, North, which he co-wrote with his wife, Jenny, who helped support his entire mission the whole way. So with Scott today, we talk about what it was like to run the infamous trail, what he ate, the process of co-writing a book with his wife, and how adventure can be so impactful in helping you rediscover your own purpose in life. We also talk about diet, recovery, raising kids, books to read, and so much more. In the spirit of an ultra run, this is a longer podcast than many on here. You might have to listen to this in two sittings, but we're off next week so you can get in some extra miles or break this up in two sittings, but it does keep getting better as we go. Enjoy the show. Scott, welcome to Wild Ideas Worth Living. Thank you. It's great to be on the show, finally. Yeah, we've met a couple times, and I think we should just start with your last adventure, the big one that you've been on a book tour for. The book is called North, and we talked a little bit about it in the intro. But what I found most fascinating is your why. why. Why you wanted to run after you've already been the most accomplished athlete, why you wanted to run the Appalachian Trail, which took 46 days, what is it, about 50 miles a day for 2,189 miles. That's correct. I think for me, the why is a, a huge answer. And I think I'm still getting pieces of that why question answered <laughs> every day. And I don't know if I'll ever get the full answer, but part of it is I was toying with this idea of like, okay, I need to fully retire or, you know, go after a few more goals that I have, or, you know, just be happy with what I've done. And I guess I was almost too content and that comfort and that just ease that life had gotten was, I guess, a wake up call to me to go after some of these big goals that I hadn't quite done in my life. And and I always told myself I wanted to do a long trail. I wanted to see what I could do on the multi-day front. And the Appalachian Trail seemed like the perfect test piece and the, the perfect stimulus to really kind of go back to those uncomfortable situations that I think athletes sometimes, you know, feel like, okay, well, if I don't have that drive and fire, and I I think that's where I was, I was in that place where happy, but at the same time, man, do I still have the, the fire that I used to have? Do, do I have the ego? Do I have the drive? And my wife, Jenny was just like either retire or, you know, really do things with a full, fire that you used to have. And I think that's, that's where I was battling. And so that's really what the why the Appalachian trail was to get that fire and that passion back. And it just seemed like the the perfect arena to do that. in. um, it's, it's something I, I had stepped on only 20 miles of the trail in total. Uh, Jenny and I hadn't been to a lot of the States that it crossed and the Eastern mountains are gnarly old mountains that I think a lot of times folks from the Rockies or out West just don't always appreciate. And it it just seemed like the perfect setup that in the the through hiking culture, the the people out there. Yeah. Let's talk about that. It's just, I mean, first of all, you went the hard way, which is crazy. 
I guess, you, you know, you went north, which to me is like the ultimate metaphor. But I, I'd love to talk about, well, first of all, what are some of the best trail names you found or you discovered on the trail? Because I think the trail names, when I first did the Appalachian Trail, like to me, just these funny names stuck out a lot. Definitely. And that's the, I, I think it speaks to the creativity of through hikers. Um, and I love a collective bunch. I mean, that's why I've stuck in this part of ultra marathoning. <laughs> uh, ultra marathoners are a very eclectic group of individuals. Uh, you know, sometimes we get categorized as these loners and freaks and, you know, wacky people that love to run long distances and just spend tons of time out in the woods or mountains. But the through hikers do the same thing, spend tons and times, tons and tons of time out in the mountains, but they also have this creativity to them. And I think that is spelled through the stuff that they write in the journals and the log and the data books uh, across the trail and the trail names. Some of them I mentioned in North one being karaoke. And I got the, uh, <laughs> the great uh, uh, pleasure of uh, listening to the skills of karaoke for 18 miles when he joined me for an 18 mile stint running with a pack that was a little bit lighter because he had a resupply coming up. But still, um, I think it's just that story of somebody who's out there through hiking with full gear wanted to run with me and he stuck with me for 18 miles and he was like, I don't care how much ibuprofen I need. I'm going to keep, keep rolling with you at the end of the day and, and get that, um, 18 mile, uh, bit in. And that, the other names too, I think that were interesting. Um, one early on in the trail, actually no poles. I gave a pair of my shoes when I was injured a week into the trail, thought for sure I'd be coming off the trail within a day or two. And I started offloading things. I was like, Hey, do you need a new pair of shoes? Um, he had these really bad old heavy boots and his feet were killing him. He had blisters and he was no poles because he didn't have trekking poles. So, um, it's really, I think some of it is like the personality, something, some kind of trait that somebody does, or in the case of my trail name, I got up in New York. So literally two thirds of the way through the trail, somebody started uh, saying, you know what, you're web walker. Cause you break down the webs in the morning and at night on the trail. Um, <laughs> so a little game of Thrones esque and a, a little bit of a uh, through hiking flair to it. So I, I gladly adopted the, the web walker. I love it. Name I'm sure. only a quarter of the way through because I got it pretty much yesterday, but I'm, I'm curious to know, did karaoke sing the whole way? He did. <laughs> so, and, like 80s um, journey? Against, like, I know, what I, I what know was karaoke, he singing? He's probably out there, and I don't know if he listens to it someday, or somebody knows karaoke but from 2015, but he was not at all a good singer, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> so he wasn't a, he was an opera-grade uh, quality, but he just sang a little bit of everything. And I think he was from the South, potentially. And he just, I don't even know what he sang, but... um. It was, uh, I tried to turn up my, my hip hop music a little bit, uh, whenever he wasn't, uh, within earshot, <laughs> he'd come back to me and be like hanging on to my buddy Knox and I, as we were, we were running along and we had a blast with him. We had, we had just fun, like talking to him. And I, I think, you know, he enjoyed it too. And that, that was the really cool, um, experience because I was going northbound, as you mentioned, it wasn't probably the best strategy from a time standpoint. However, uh, last year's record was set going northbound. So. You know, maybe the, the trend is to go north, but clearly there are some benefits of getting the whites and Maine out of the way early on. But I think really having that experience to be able to spend three, five, ten, in the case of karaoke, 18 miles, I wouldn't have been able to do that southbound with other through hikers because about 90 percent from most of the data I've seen go northbound. So mm. it was a cool experience cool. to be able to interact with them on the trail. Yeah. Besides at the shelters, I'd sign in at log books and and talk to them. And I felt like I still was part of the community and hopefully they felt that way too. I wasn't this, this guy who was like, Oh, getting aid every time uh, there was a major road crossing and, and just not experiencing what through hiker life. And I definitely wanted to sleep in uh, more shelters than I did. <laughs> the couple that I, I did along the way, it, it would have been more fun to hang out, but it just wasn't that uh, time, especially when it was pouring down rain and I had another 15 miles to go. And so envious of people snuggled up in their sleeping bags. So how did you do it? I mean, how, like, what did you say to yourself? I mean, I know you listen to hip hop. Like, was there an inner mantra that you kept saying during some of the hardest parts? 50 miles a day. I know you can do that, but 50 miles a day for 46 days is no joke. Yeah, it's really hard. And the mantras um, evolve over time. But the first couple that really started hitting me were 
I mentioned this in North, my buddy Horty, who comes out and anyone who reads the book will get a good dose of Horty. He told me when I was most injured a weekend and thought everything was over, he was like, you know, just remember this boy. This is who I am and this is what I do. And it's really simple, but I had to remember, you know, each day, you know, my myself that was back at home, my self who was used to winning ultra marathons. Um, I needed to forget, you know, you draw on those experiences, obviously, of my past life. But right now I was somebody going after the speed record. I was a through hiker where every day I'd wake up and do, you know, 50 miles a day, sometimes more, sometimes a little less. And that's who I am. And that's what I do. And, and really, I just had to lock into that focus of just that single minded intent of putting one foot in front of the other, waking up every day, even though I felt, oh, gosh, I'm going to go do another 50 miles again and just get out there. And so that was a real simple mantra that really helped. And remembering um, people in my life who had struggled, such as my mother who had MS for 30 years before she passed away and, and seeing and growing up with a loved one, a mother who was supposed to be taking care of me, having to take care of her and my brother and sister. And um, those were experiences where I really drew on and, and drew on her, her whole mantra. Her, her whole mantra was as simple as like, don't worry about me. I'm tough. You know, I'm tough. I'm tough. And she would always say that. And I think we do need to remind ourselves that we are tough. We are strong. We can get through things. And um, again, very simple, but I would remember those things. And same with Jenny um, and all the struggles that she had been through and trying to have a child in the miscarriages and the emergency room um, literally you know, bled to death from an ectopic pregnancy. Um, I would draw on those experiences and remember that, you know what, I'm in a lot of pain, but I can... I can, I can do this. I could still put one foot in front of the other and I'm just going to have to remember, you know, this is who I am. This is what I do. Well, that's, that's good advice. I love how you write about your mom and the people you love like Jenny. And you know, what I liked about this book is I've never read a book that was back and forth. So you wrote this book with Jenny, your wife. What was it like to just go on this adventure with her? It was it was amazing. I mean, I I won't uh, I won't lie. I'm we're we're a good team, and we know we know how to push each other. We know how to um, give each other tough love. We know how to you know comfort each other when we need it. Um, but it, it's difficult. Like I I would recommend that couples and you know close people, even close friends, it's it's good to test a friendship, a partnership. I don't know if you have to do 2,200 miles at a speed record <laughs> times pace, but um, it, it really tests a relationship and it, it really, you do come away from it ideally a lot stronger. I mean, some people, you know, it's funny, they would joke, be like, oh, that's, that's a recipe for, you know, ending up, uh, you know, having divorce attorneys at the end. And for some people, it's maybe not the best choice, but I think it was something we needed to do together. We love doing things in the mountains. We love, um, we love, I guess, just getting back to a simpler life. And it was a way for us to recalibrate as a couple, recalibrate as individuals who were kind of struggling with this idea of like, okay, are we going to adopt children? Or maybe, you know, maybe it's not in the cards. Maybe we just won't have children. That's, that's something. So we were at that point where we had some tough life stuff to work through and working through that together through a shared common goal. Um, granted one that would really push us to the the brink, but it was a good way to come away, uh, with a better understanding of each other and be able to do something that was really tough as a team. And I think that's, that's very worthwhile. It, it's a little scary and daunting. There's no doubt about it. We, we, at times I mentioned this in North, like I, I told her like, let's just go home. We're like pushing each other too far. Um, you know, this might actually break us more than make us stronger. But it didn't, which is great. And what's interesting is I've interviewed now a couple of people who've through hiked the Pacific Crest Trail. And the last girl I interviewed is Aspen Mattis, who wrote Girl in the Woods. And she said, you know, for her, it was about finding strength. She's like, I, I didn't think I was strong, but every day after walking 20 miles a day or more, I proved to myself how strong I was over and over again. And it's like, on this trail, you have no choice but to prove to each other how strong you are over and over again, it seems like. Oh, 
definitely. And I feel like that's where um, we write about this. And I mentioned that you know, Jenny at the beginning of the interview here, we were talking about how she was like, you know, you know, either retire or get out there and like be your best self. And like, I want to see the old you know, Scott Jurek, the one who like really like fights to win. And she got to see that and then some, and I feel like sometimes she'll, she'll talk candidly about this. She was like, wow, I thought maybe I was pushing you too far. And she's like, wow. And she was really impressed with that. And the only way to convey that I think was to share our, our both of our stories. And that's another recipe, like writing a book together was way harder than <laughs> doing the trail together. So I, um, I think we had more, I think we had more arguments and more, um, you know, just full on just yelling at each other and just like frustration uh, writing the book um, together. But I'm glad we did because her story and her being able to see it through her eyes was what other people were seeing from the outside. So it was a it wasn't an easy process, um, not from the standpoint of like now you're writing with two people, but it was hard to like bring in like her side of it seamlessly at the right moment and then match with mine. And, and that was a difficult thing. I mean, Jenny and I definitely were were challenged quite uh, quite rigorously in the, the writing process as well. But it, it did make us strong. And that's another thing, too. We would have gladly been out on the AT than sitting in front of computer screens and pulling our hair out over things. But I think we have to do those tough things, um, both as individuals, but also as a couple. It, it's good to, to push the boundaries and to really struggle at times. How did you handle those tough arguments? Like, I'm curious, because for my fiance and I, Often we'll use humor, but sometimes we'll just have to full out wrestling match. Oh, you! Ha- I feel like emotions, you got to get the emotions out. But then, and I, we mentioned a couple of uh, blowouts. And, you know, we've, we've also just through hiked um, and section hiked on the Pacific Crest Trail. It's kind of our thing that we're doing. We're on the 20 year plan right now. We got to do more than 100 cool. miles each time. But we, um, you know, a lot of times we, we'll get in like these discussions and they'll get heated and they'll turn it into our, and that's how actually I ended up on the Appalachian trails. We had an argument of, she was like, you know, just retire, quit, you know, quit, you know, showing up at races, you know, running just like a half ass effort, you know, get out there and do it. And it was through like those arguments of just sometimes we'd take long breaks. Like I'll just, she's like, you know, you just walk ahead. And so we take these long, you know, hours of just walking by ourselves. And then we come back together and like had, after it had some time for the steam to, to cool off, but the emotion does have to occur. And like on the Appalachian trail, we, you know, she was hollering at me, we were screaming at each other. And then, you know, then we're crying and it's just like this outburst of emotions. And then it's like, okay, you know what? And she's like, no, we're going to keep going. Whereas I was like, you know what? I'm, I'm like, this is stupid. Like we're pushing ourselves too far. Let's just go home. And she's like, no, you know, we got to do this. So I think it's being able to like rebound from those emotions and not stay in that emotional state for too long, but you, you have to get through the emotions so that you can start thinking, okay, what's the strategy here? How are we going to make this better? How are we going to resolve this? And how are we going to move forward? Cause on the AT, it wasn't like the clock could stop. We could like hit pause and be like, okay, we got to hash this out the clock kept going. And so if we were mad at each other for much longer than a few hours, um, things were going to get pretty rough. And she, she sure. was, yeah. I mean, was she your full support crew the whole time? She was, um, she did the whole trail. I have buddies who, you know, set records on the Appalachian trail and who do speed <laughs> record stuff. And, uh, their, their significant others come out for just a short bit. Like they'll come out for a week at a time. But Jenny seems <laughs> so the fact that amazing. she was game, yeah, 46 days, um, dedicating two months. Uh, and she wasn't the entirety. Like we did have friends come out from time to time, but she was the only individual who was out there from start to finish, uh, besides myself. And we wanted to have time by ourselves. And then we had these friends come out and we needed to like put SOS calls, especially at the end when it was like, wow, we really need our A team right now. And friends that said, oh yeah, we'll try to come out. But you know, it just never happens. And we didn't do as good of a job of like getting people to commit. But I think that's maybe like a lot of people's friends. It's hard for them to you know, drop their lives for five days or a week and say, I'm going to come out and, and watch you slave away and make sure that you have everything you need at, at road crossing. So what I think is so cool about this journey is that, you know, like it was a complete wild idea. You didn't have a ton of time to prepare and you just did it. You know, you didn't really train for it. Did you? I mean, it sounds like your no. running has been your training. Yeah, exactly. I mentioned <laughs> that's what I used to joke with Jenny before we went on the trip because she would kind of give me a hard time. Like, yeah, you're doing 
you know, some pretty good workouts, but you're not training as hard. And I was like, you know, 20 years of ultra marathon racing is my training. And I'm like 40 years of life is also my training. So I kind of used, and I'm not saying it was the best approach. And some people say, well, you weren't as prepared. You know, we could have studied more. I could have asked my buddy speed goat about every little detail and, and get the cliffs notes uh, version of setting a record on the Appalachian trail or, you know, how you, how you go about something like a supported speed attempt. But we, we kind of wanted that unknown. And I think because the Appalachian trail in and of itself was an unknown to us, neither of us had hiked it in its entirety. Most of the record setters have at least hiked it once, know it well, have studied it. And we just, we didn't want that. So I think I didn't want to go into it untrained, but I also didn't want to go into it, say like how I approached a hundred mile race, because I knew some of the training was going to happen on the trail. Um, cause you can't train for 300 mile weeks, 350 mile weeks without you know, getting injuries. So it was, it was a real, I guess, delicate balance. And I like the idea of like, okay, can I do this with good training? Um, but maybe not optimal training. And uh, we were just also busy with life too. You know, I was managing all these little elements of my, uh, business of speaking and writing and, um, sponsor commitments. And I feel like I was yeah, caught up in this whirlwind of like trying to get training in between all that stuff. Well, I love that you said you wanted some of the unknown because I think that's where the beauty of adventure lies. You know, I have to ask you because so many people wrote to me when they found out I was interviewing you, you know, what did you eat? And I'm really curious how, how you prepared food. Like, did you have a Nutribullet or like any hacks? Cause you're vegan and, mm -hmm. and I eat that way, which is actually sometimes easier, I'm guessing, on the trail. But how did you do it and what did you eat? So it was a combination. Like I had all these plans. We did have a solar panel on our van. That was one thing I got installed. We didn't have windows, but we had a solar panel. So um, that <laughs> was the other thing. Van. Like trying, to get, trying, to get, trying to get a van, um, a cargo van, ready to go um, in a matter of a month and a half was not easy. And we literally, you know, made, you know, made a, a decent bed. We did get a solar panel and we had plenty of power on board. So I could, we did have a Vitamix and we were able, Jenny was able to make really dense smoothies, which was helpful. And I had packed all these like non-perishable item, items like coconut milk and there were cans of chili and I had all these boxes and Jenny after a while was just like, you know, you're not eating as much of this stuff and it's just taking up more room. And so she ended up pitching some of that, giving it to friends um, who would have come out or you know, have them bring it back to their house. And we ended up relying on, especially at times, she would try and find things at diners, uh, whether it was you know, home fries and potatoes and um, getting things that she could that were vegan on the trail in addition to like making food. And Jenny's not a cook at home. She, she's the, uh, she's the bachelor in terms of like, you know, she'd live off of veggie burgers that have frozen in the, the freezer and whatever she can put together. Um, and so it was like a role reversal too. So it was hard for her to always you know, have an array of foods out. Uh, I ate a lot of cliff products throughout the run too. Um, I did a lot of sports foods, but then Jenny would make things. So we did have a propane stove that we were able to mount on a, a countertop and she had to learn how to like make all these different things. And she would just add more and more fat to things. So when you're trying to get in seven, 8,000 calories a day, the, the easiest thing to do is lather more fat on the thing. So she would take basically a typical, you know, vegan grilled cheese uh, is when she could find vegan cheese at, you know, a Walmart or a major grocery store occasionally, which doesn't happen much, especially uh, Virginia and South. But she would make basically what I called fat sandwiches. She would put cheese inside um, layers of avocado, practically a whole avocado, lather the sides with coconut oil and then stick it on the, the griddle and <laughs> fry it up. And it would just be this like greasy goo. But it probably packed over a thousand calories into there. So there were, th there were methods like that where they're not things you would eat at home, but when you're trying to put in tons of calories every day and, and do it in a format. Um, and there were simple times when I just would take swigs of olive oil or flax oil um, in the morning. And again, that's not something I'd advise doing, but um, it's hard to keep it down without um, just wanting to vomit it back up. But there were just methods like I would eat the fruit and uh, very little veggies. This is another thing. Not I'm I'm a type of you know quinoa kale yeah. person at home, but it was more of the refined carbohydrates. It was 
a lot of fat. And then literally I probably had two salads the whole trip. Jenny would throw in kale and try to sneak in greens. And we had these like superfood powders and, and things, but it was really about convenience and packing in calories and nutrients as much as possible. So it was, it was a different setup. You were kind of like, you were kind of advanced. Sounds like. I, I kind of, I mean, it's, it's like one of those things of like, Oh, is this, is this how I would eat normally? No, I would have much rather have had, you know, all this like healthy food that I typically, but in order to get those calories, I would be, you know, chewing and it would just be impossible to do, I think. And that's where the sports foods came in handy while I was on the trail. I would, you know, pack in and this cliff organic energy, basically it was like a puree that they had all these new flavors for me. And I was, you know, testing out all these things and I would just, you know, gun down a couple of coconut milk lattes in the morning to kind of wake me up and just things that were of convenience because Jenny, again, had so many elements. Like she was washing laundry in town every couple of days. She was having to gas the van, do the dishes, um, keep the van somewhat <laughs> just like livable for her instead of like wet, you know, mildewy clothes everywhere and, and shoes that were just stinking. So she had all these things to do. So there's no time to really cook gourmet meals and like these really nice things. So it was sometimes like, okay, here's two coconut milk lattes, um, prepackaged, shelf-stable. <laughs> here's here's a couple of Cliff Bars and a couple of bananas, and this is what you get, and that's what I'd eat in the morning as I, like, walked away or as I, like, you know, laced up my shoes and took care of my feet. Did you carry a cell phone as well to get a hold of each other? Um, we did, but a lot of it was non it just really didn't even matter. It was a, a non-issue because I would get reception on the ridges and then Jenny would be stuck down in these deep valleys where there was zero reception. Mm. Um, particularly uh, Virginia South, there wasn't great cell phone reception. So that, that was the really tricky talk about, you know, a test of trust. She just always had to trust that I was going to come through that tiny little ribbon of trail, pop out between the trees on a dirt road in the middle of nowhere and make the location that I had told her roughly around the time that I said, and especially late nights when I'd be finishing up the day, she'd be stuck at these trailheads because you know, I'd be in the dark and it had rained and uh, the trail was just a lot slower going. So I'd come in two, three hours late and she'd be stuck in these, you know, dirt roads out in the middle of nowhere, just hoping that there'd be a headlamp at some point. And, and in between winks of, you know, taking a nap or, or getting a little bit of sleep, which she hardly, she had, just as probably a little sleep as I did most of the time. So it, it was difficult for her to, to like balance all of those elements while you know, she was doing the, the basics. So it was an interesting element for sure. We're going to take a quick break to hear from our sponsor. When we come back, we talk about how Scott kept going, even though he got injured early on, advice to those on the trail or those who want to be, the plant-based movie he's featured in that has some awesome footage of the AT and so much more. Stay tuned. This episode was brought to you by REI Co-op, a brand who not only gets you the gear you need to get outside, but helps you get out there and explore. Anytime I've had a big adventure, I've loaded up on gear at REI. I've always loved their inclusive approach and the fact that the store provides tons of education on and off their floor. I've taken lots of classes at REI from orienteering to rock climbing, even beginning backpacking and survival skills. They also have tons of experiences from safari in Tanzania to trekking in the Alps and backpacking trips to the Great Smoky Mountains. I've been a member since 1996, and I love partnering with them on the show this year. You can go to REI.com to check out the latest gear, classes, experiences, to find a store near you, and to read great stories about adventure and the outdoors. So without completely giving the book away, I mean, I think people know you you did break the record, which is amazing. But it sounds like you've kind of refound your sense of purpose as well. I, I love it. I love just it sounds like the ultimate adventure. And no book has made me want to go to the South more than your book. I actually went to school in the South. And my first experience hiking really was on the Appalachian Trail in Georgia. You know, any oh, advice? That's awesome. It was awesome. Any advice yeah. to others who just are a little lost in their life, or maybe they're in a transition or they're just bored. Just any advice on how you can find your sense of direction again and maybe use adventure to do that. Definitely. And I think that's what this was about. I mean, I think some people are like, Oh, it's, it's kind of a, a book about a, 
um, almost washed up ultra marathoner, but it's really the way we wrote it was to inspire people who, no matter what point you are in life, it doesn't have to be midlife. It doesn't have to be struggling with, you know, a, the concept of having a family or, you know, the relationship of, um, having a partner, you could really be in your twenties, but like you said, just being stuck, being like, you know, wondering like, is this what I'm supposed to do? And, um, not that you're wandering aimlessly. Cause I feel like we're never wandering aimlessly. We're always, you know, learning, we're always moving forward in life, or at least that's what we should be doing. But if you do need a sense of direction, I think a pilgrimage is one of the best ways. And I feel like people, humans have been doing pilgrimages, um, whether you want to call them vision quests, um, you name it. People have been doing that for eons and eons. And I feel like it doesn't have to have a, you know, a, a, a so-called spiritual or religious element to it. Sometimes it can, but taking a long walk, there's nothing like it because anybody can walk. Um, you don't have to you know, run and walk 21, 89 miles. You don't have to do a full uh, long trail. You could even just do a three, four day vision quest um, walking somewhere. It could be even some people are like, well, I don't have the means to walk um, out in the woods. I don't have gear. I don't have set up, but maybe it's some kind of like urban walk or, or something. I feel like walking, there's something about the rhythm, the movement. Uh, it helps us psychologically, puts our brain, there's something called the, the central pattern generator. When I was in physical therapy school, I was always fascinated how we have this innate reflexive walking pattern uh, that's been built into our brain and our nervous system. And it's fascinating to me that maybe that sets um, our brain and our psychology in a, in a better pattern. So I feel like walking pilgrimages have been something that's part. So I'd encourage anybody and you could obviously do any sport or any art form uh, as a means of like a, a pilgrimage, but um, there's something about going for a long walk. I, I had a gentleman actually at one of my book events come up to me who is struggling with depression. And, you know, it's really hard for me to give advice. Um, I've, I've not had severe depression, so I can't claim to be an expert, nor am I a psychologist or psychiatrist, but he was trying to ask, like, what could I do um, to break myself out of this? And I told him one of the best things I think from all the through hikers that I've seen on the trail, both the AT and the Pacific Crest Trail, you know, take a walk, um, maybe even just a few days, maybe it's a week. And I just think people come away from those experiences um, somehow changed or reset. I think it's super advantageous. So I'm a big fan of uh, getting out there and walking. Thank you. I think that's such great advice to anybody, especially if you're having a hard time in life or you're at a crossroads. It's as innate as it can be. But in Born to Run, you know, Chris talks also about how running is incredibly innate. You did break down during the run right early on. I mean, how did you keep going? I know you're a physical therapist, but like what are some techniques you use to just stay strong physically? One of the biggest things for me was trusting the human body and my human body to heal itself. And you would think after all these years, like you said, I've got a background in physical therapy. One might think it'd be easy for me to just like, oh, no problem. But uh, it's very easy to doubt your body when you're injured. Yeah. And I think as somebody who's had many types of running injuries, many types of musculoskeletal um, nerve injuries, you name it. It's, it's one of those things where every time that I'm injured, I always wonder like, how is this going to heal? Um, why does it hurt so much? It's not like it, um, the pain gets any easier, but the, the biggest thing for me was I had to trust my body and my buddy, Cordy, who again, sometimes has the most half sage advice and the craziest wisdom. He'll be like, you know, your body will remember a way to heal itself. Your body will remember. He kept telling me that as you know, he left me in uh, the depths of Tennessee when I was hobbling with two bad legs, torn quad, flaring uh, kneecap, runner's knee. And he was, he told me like, your body will remember to heal itself. And I, and I had to trust that. And one of the biggest things that I did was find ways to take the stress off. Cause this is a lot of people would say, well, why don't you just stop? Um, however, stopping wasn't an option for me. So what I did is I literally walked solid for two days. I didn't run a step. Um, I tested it on the second day to see if I could run a little bit. And what I had to do was just trust my body that 
if I took the load off. And so taking the load off meant no running on downhills, um, no running on flats when I felt like, oh, this is so perfect. And even though I was in a lot of pain, it would have been real easy to be like, oh, well, I could jog this a little bit and test it. So I was real diligent on not running for two days. I was also diligent on icing the knees when I got back to the van at night. I would also take my poles and use them almost like crutches and kind of like take some of the weight off each leg. So simple things that a lot of times people wouldn't, or I may not have even thought of, but when I had a long time out there, a full, you know, 16 hours and 17, 18 hours when I'd be out there um, hobbling, I would just try and think like, how can I mitigate this pain as much as possible? And it hurt, it hurt like hell for a lot of the time, those two days. But if I could just decrease the stress, if I could take down the inflammation at night, I tried um, a little bit of even some painkillers and anti-inflammatories and they didn't really seem to make a difference, but it was the little things, the basic rehab things that we all have in our arsenal uh, that were probably the most effective. I did some pneumatic compression while I was on the trail too. Since we had the solar panel, I could uh, use pneumatic compression. And that basically is like a um, graduated uh, pressure that's um, in the air-filled chambers that kind of just go up the leg. And so I wore these big air-filled leg sleeves that would milk my legs and just kind of, you know, push as much uh, of the, the bad stuff and the, uh, basically all the antibodies and, and things that were working its way, the inflammation process through my, through my lower legs. So that was helpful as well. But really when it came down to it, it was decreasing the stress and making sure that I could just maintain a, a little bit. And that's, I think that's a lesson for everyone. Like sometimes you can't run perfectly on roads, sometimes running incline on a treadmill, three to 8% um, is one of the best things to do while you're recovering and run. Maybe if you can run pain-free for five minutes, do that. And that's what, that's what I did the, the following days as I ran a little bit more each day um, over the course, instead of thought, Oh, things feel pretty good after two, three days, I'm going to run 50 miles today, or I'm going to run, you know, 80% of that. The beauty of the AT is that it forces you to walk as you probably remember. Um, it's not like it's a, a fast trail to run by any stretch. So it was good that it was rocky and rugged, but that also made for more stress on the knee. Oh, that's such good wisdom. Thank you, Scott. I mean, when I get injured, running is disastrous and I feel like my world has ended mm -hmm. and it's always the knee. So this is great advice. I want to get one of those pneumatic. Can you say that again? Oh, pneumatic compression. They um, don't sound the cheap. Brand that I was a, they're not cheap. And I, I justify, I always tell people it, it's, you know, we massage therapists are great, but the beauty of that is, you know, if you add up how many massages mm. people get, you, yeah. you can pay, you can pay for um, an, an pneumatic compression unit pretty quick. And cool. I was using, and the beauty is they've come down in price too. Um, Norma Tech has a real portable unit that I was using and now it's become even more portable. It's smaller, it's more affordable and they're actually pretty cool. And that, that way you can, you can turn it on for 15, 20 minutes whenever you need it. And I think that's the convenience is a big thing. A lot of people don't do massage because it's like, Oh, I got a schedule and you got to remember to get into, <laughs> you got to schedule ahead of time. Cause I know my massage therapist that I've used over the years, I'm like, oh, I can't get in for three weeks. So it, it can be a handy uh, modality. It's, it's not, um, it's not going to cure everything, but I found it to be effective for recovery and a number of things. Any, any advice to people who want to go do the AT now or who, who are on it? and listening? Oh, I would, I would say trust in yourself and know that you're going to get to Springer or Katahdin, you know, or if you're, you know, doing, uh, doing the flip flop thing and like, you know, jumping over sections, um, you just have to, you have to really trust in yourself. And I think that's one of the biggest things because there are going to be so many obstacles and know that this is the thing that's amazed me over the years of all the difficult races and all the training that I've done and all the amazing victories I've had. I'm always amazed at how strong the human body and mind and spirit are. And I would say to them, like, you know, it seems really simple, but we are always stronger than we think we are. And it, it comes through, over and over again and doing something like a through hike of the Appalachian trail. So, and those who are thinking about doing it, the biggest thing is getting out there. As you mentioned early in the interview, Jenny and I were just kind of, after a while, we're like, you know what, we got to just do this. And I had been toying with the idea for 
you know, six, eight months. And I'd been like, you know, we've got to do this. And Jenny was like, okay, yeah, it's another one of his ideas. It's like another race where, oh yeah, he's going to do it. And then at one point after she had another miscarriage, it was like, we, we had all the more reason of like, we got to just do this. And it's really easy to put excuses in front of those goals that you have. And I think the Appalachian Trail, I, I ran into a woman recently at one of my book events. And she said, I was supposed to be on the trail this week. And something came up in the family um, where she couldn't go. And I said, just make sure that you get out there, you know, next time around. And it's real easy to, to find reasons not to get out there. So I'd say the, the first step is even if everything isn't perfect in life, the time is now. And Jenny and I um, had been reminded of that multiple times and Mm -hmm. when we were driving out it seemed like oh there's so many things that we haven't done are we really ready for this and after a while we just had to be like you know what we're on our way to georgia right now driving across the country and everything just felt right then once we got that out of our heads of like oh it's not perfect we're not ready there's so many things we should have done Uh, but once you get out there you forget all of that so that's what i tell people who are thinking about it like do your planning do enough homework don't be totally unprepared but after a while, you've got to just get out there and, and learn along the way too. That's why so many people, um, they cut down, they get new packs, they, they cut stuff off their packs. They, they ditch extra gear that they didn't need because they start to realize like what is most important. And sometimes you just got to get out there and, and be, be a hack and, and be a little, um, maybe not so prepared. I think you want to be prepared so you don't freeze to death and you don't, um, you know, don't do things like leave your food out and a bear um, attacks you or attacks your food. Like don't do the stupid yeah, that things, would be dumb. but <laughs> yeah, but you got to be out there um, and learning along the way a little bit too. You can't, it's not like you can prepare so well that like everything goes fine. And as through hikers will tell you, you're, you're going to have those days where you're like, what the hell am I doing out here? This is stupid. Um, I'm not ready for this, but that's the beauty of it too. You've got to have that struggle. Yeah. And while you're doing this, you were filming this movie, Game Changers. How, how did that work while you're on the Appalachian Trail? I mean, it sounds like they started filming while you were there. Uh, maybe you could just tell us a little bit about the movie, what it's about and, and how that worked. Yeah. Well, and, and they were filming. I definitely, Sorry, like, they were filming. Thing, yeah, that's, that's what that's I meant to say. I, um, but yeah, you're no, part okay. of the, you're participating in this giant so movie funny. produced by James yeah. Cameron. Yeah. And so many people, um, so like, Oh yeah, you know, jerk had this big film crew out there and they were really just kind of like, you know, in the bushes behind the scenes. I don't even remember really talking to much of the film crew besides uh, when they started at Springer. Um, and they got there a couple days early, but they were just kind of like hiding out doing their thing. They would like, you know, poke the camera in when I'd be rolling up, open the van door or when I'd be, so they just kind of did their thing. And, it was unique because Jenny and I didn't have this master plan of like, Oh yeah, we want this recorded and we want it um, documented so that we have this video. We were so unprepared. Everybody assumed, Oh yeah, you've got this, you know, PR team and machine. And I was like, no, it's just Jenny and I putting a little bit up on Instagram and Facebook. So it was funny when the film crew was there. They came out because they asked me, Hey, do you have anything happening in terms of races or big things that you're doing. I'm like, well, yeah. I'm taking, I'm taking, I'm taking off in a month for the Appalachian trail. And so they put together, uh, this team of camera folks. In fact, they were only going to come out for a few days, like, like four times throughout the trip. And they ended up sending a team back to cover me from literally from Pennsylvania, all the way North to Katahdin. And they did after Louis Sahoyas Academy award winning director of the Cove, he saw the first few days and was like, gosh, we got to like get more people out here and, and covering this. And so the film crew, it, it was amazing to watch them work alongside. They'd have cameras rigged up and, you know, these expensive red cameras and running them down um, a zip line <laughs> basically cool. to follow me. And so there's some amazing footage that I can't wait for people to, to check out. And the film isn't all about me. It's about vegan plant-based athletes and it, it, what they're really trying to do, Game Changers is really trying to dispel some of the myths from the angle of strength and power and endurance and really show that you can perform on a vegan diet, uh, no matter what sport or what activity you do. And I think people who aren't even active will be inspired by the film. So I, I'm really excited. It's hopefully going to be released um, 
later this year. Um, it was premiered at Sundance and I know they're making a few tweaks like all films that get premiered at Sundance. So um, I'm really looking forward to sharing that. Plus the footage of the AT is, um, it's footage like it's, I, I don't think it's been seen before. A lot of people who've seen it have been this, like, I fight the AT and I've never seen it like that wow. um, from a filming. So it, it was really neat. And to be able to work with uh, Louis' talented camera crew, they just did their thing. And I was blown away with, with some of the footage and they saw the highs and lows. So yeah, I'm excited for that. Be a fun film. I mean, you've been the poster child for success as a vegan athlete for years. And I think the secret's out now. I mean, people get it. There's a lot of people who are vegan now. It's, it's really cool to see. And it's pretty easy to get healthy food. Oh, and it's definitely, you've really yeah, helped what, lead that charge. Oh, well, thank you. I mean, I, I think there's been a lot of people and I got inspired by other individuals. And I, that's what I love about movements like this. And even just like the food movement to try and get people, I think some of the most exciting stuff is to get you know, desert landscapes when it comes to food, um, getting healthier options. So it's not just fast foods and you know, say in urban environments where neighborhoods where their only option is a convenience store, um, food trucks and, and things like that and getting healthy produce and farmers markets to these areas is probably like the biggest thing. I feel like rural areas they've, they've done, cause I lived in a, you know, rural area where we grew a lot of food and we, we hunted and fished for a lot of food. And so I feel like rural settings, it's more pop, but when it comes to packaged food or food that's brought in, Jenny was still amazed. Like some, she would ask like, where's your frozen fruit? And they're like, Oh, it's down by the cool whip. Um, and so it's still, like you said, it, it's changing, but in a lot of rural areas, you know, they think, Oh yeah, we've got one bag of frozen strawberries and it's down by all these oh. other things like cool whip and, yeah. and things like that. So it hasn't changed in certain areas. And so there is a, like an education that has to occur. And mm. I, I think it's important that we do it in a real, I don't know, like, not so much in your face and cram it down people's throats, but in an encouraging fashion. And that's what I've tried to do is show people because, Hey, I was a hunting, fishing backwoods boy from Minnesota. The last thing I thought I would be doing is being a, a vegan 20 years later. So I think for people, um, yeah, we have to do it in a fashion that empowers them and makes them feel like they're part of it. And there are some people where it is going to be a harder sell for sure, but it's happening. Yeah, I, I appreciate it. I can't wait for that movie to come out. You know, really quickly, because this this is supposed to be a podcast as long as you can go for a run, but not a Scott Jerk style <laughs> run. Kind of a quick one. Okay. I want to talk about dad life. So now you've had, you know, kids, plural, since this big adventure. You know, any any just advice, I guess, to dads out there raising adventurous kids and some of the amazing learnings you've taken being a dad? Wow. I'm by no means an expert, so I don't have 20 years under my belt, like running ultra marathons. Um, but, uh, I guess the, the biggest thing is that it's, it's a wild ride. It's, it's like doing the AT and then some, um, when I spoke earlier about doing challenging things as a couple or as friends, uh, to test friendships and partnerships, um, having children is definitely one of those things. I mean, it's, it's a full on, uh, just team effort to be able to bring somebody into this world and then um, keep them alive and keep them safe and keep them learning. And so right now having a two-year-old and now we um, Ravens two and evergreen now is four months old. It's definitely been more interesting when you add another uh, human being into the mix. The biggest thing I hope to do is encourage them to keep, learning and pushing their boundaries, whatever that might be at watching a two-year-old. I was just up in the mountains yesterday with, with Raven and Evergreen, um, one on my front, one on the back, <laughs> and it was, you know, 60 pounds of weight, including the pack and all the, the gear. And we, we spent a day up in the Indian peaks wilderness. And it's just so fun to watch the world through a two years, two year old eyes, or even a four month old and just watch them like look around and watch, you know, mosquitoes swarming them and they could care less. It's like, let's throw more rocks in the lake and let's throw more rocks into the Creek and, you know, touching the bark of the tree and, and seeing a moose and it's baby calf um, out swimming in the in an Alpine Lake. I mean, those are things that are some of my fondest memories as a kid growing up is spending those times out in the outdoors with 
um, my dad and my mother and being able to you know, build forts and run around like free. So I just hope to allow them to, you know, protect them obviously, but let them explore and learn through, um, hopefully the best example that I can be. And I'm nowhere perfect by any stretch. I know it's, it's always a challenge each day to, to deal with a, a two-year-old that's got a mind of their own and, and thinks they know everything and wants to be independent. So it's always a struggle, but I do feel best when you know, I watch, watch them learning out in the woods and out in the mountains. And I just hope I can encourage them to always keep that a part of their life and, and keep the natural world as uh, an important aspect of theirs. You sound incredibly calm for having a four month and a two year old. <laughs> well, it's easy to talk when, you know, they're not right. Usually when I've done podcast interviews, uh, especially the last month or two, I've got my little four month old guy on my wearing him on my chest while uh, he takes a nap and, you know, we're hoping that he doesn't wake up. So, um, Raven's, uh, doing a little preschool these days for COVID, but yeah, Jenny and I, we're, you know, we're juggling work and family commitments while um, having them at home. And it's a little crazy uh, for, the first, for the first time. And I feel like it's it's a very rewarding experience. And I think it's important that they spend a lot of time with their parents. But let me tell you, there's days where I'm just like, what did we just do? <laughs> it's, my, it's my buddy, Carl, uh, who uh, is, is in the book, a main character, Speed Goat. He, Jenny was like, how come you don't have kids? And he's like, well, that would mean I'd have to arrange my life. And he's like, my friend's like, oh, you can do it. He's like, why would I want to do that? My life is perfect the way it is. So um, I do, you know, caution people that, you know, life changes dramatically in so many great ways, but it's, it's a struggle. I'm not going to lie. It's not easy. So even though I sound calm, it's because I don't have Raven running around here uh, wanting me to take her outside and, you know, get her on her bike and her scooter and like you know, going I'm, a mile in a minute and like having another four month old crying in stereo with the two year old. So it's um, like I said, it's it's a challenging uh, environment to place oneself in. And then the sleep deprivation It's like our little guy doesn't like to sleep now. So the AT was a good, uh, good training grounds for that, for sure, as people will find out in North. I slept very little the last few weeks um, of the trail and found a whole new level of sleep deprivation uh, capability in me. Wow. Okay. So this is good birth control for everybody. <laughs> so, well, yeah. And I don't want to sound or, like a downer. Or, it's, no, it's no, no. or prep or prep to, you know, just but, go yeah, do exactly. the Appalachian trail to PCT before you have kids. I totally yeah. appreciate this, Scott. Yeah. And I think it's being honest too. Yeah. A lot of people think, oh yeah, it's going to be amazing. And Jenny and I, you know, it's like, we struggled for so many years to have children mm -hmm. and to be like, whoa, we struggled for this. And we're like, we took this on and we wanted this. And then there are the other days where it just makes everything worth it. And I think that's a lot like life. It's a lot like the Appalachian Trail. It's a lot um, for those who are at a moment, moment in their life where they're struggling. And as we mentioned, like finding out like, wow, gosh, where do I go next? But then you do something, you get through that and you're like, wow, like that was, even though I was suffering, even though I was hurting, even though it was seemed like the worst time in my life, um, you come away from it. And I, I just remember those times the most, um, the times when I was struggling, not only on the Appalachian trail, but in life the most. And I feel like that's what children can do for you. Mm. Um, they will, <laughs> they will test you in ways that, um, and then, and people tell me, I uh, wait till they become teenagers. So, um, supposedly I have it easy now. Um, supposedly all, all new parents have it easy until they like, become teenagers. Sounds but. like you guys are epic parents though. You're taking them outside. They're getting to see the world and, I don't know. I think you guys are going to do great. I've heard that. Yeah. I mean, it's different for everybody, but a four month and a two year old, I think that sounds like a lot of work. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And traveling too with kids are great. So I, you know, I know you do a lot of traveling and you encourage that on your podcasts. Um, you know, adventures can happen, you know, just in the backyard, but traveling, um, Raven's been to Bhutan. We've had you know, the, the wild of experience of bringing them on book tour most recently to a one month old and then a almost two year old. And so I think like, you know, including them in your lives um, is important too, because even though it is a struggle and it adds a whole nother dimension, it's pretty cool to watch them go through things like that. Mm, sounds awesome. I saw on your Instagram today, you had like, or it was from a few days ago, you had some books you were reading and there was some kids books and then you had Stranger in the Woods, who I just had on Michael Finkel, the author of that book. You know, any other books that you love that you're reading now or that you recommend for adventurers? Well, one that um, was pretty instrumental, and actually Chris McDougall recommended it to me 
Um, and it's funny, the author is actually here from Colorado. It's a, it's an out of print book. I mean, I love out of print, um, old books from the seventies and eighties or even older sometimes, um, to get inspired by. And Mm -hmm. bone games was one that Chris McDougall was like, Oh man, when I was reading stuff for born to run and some of my own like research, um, I came across this book and you really would dig it. And, um, I must've read that book like three times now. It's been really helpful. Um, I'd highly recommend to you from like a health, cause I feel like, you know, adventures can happen in health and wellness yeah. and my whole diet has been an adventure, I think, and it, lifestyle changes are big adventures. And Andrew Weil's books have been a huge help to me. Um, his book, Spontaneous Healing, I think was part of the reason why I, I trusted Horty's wisdom of like the body remembers a way to heal itself. Um, his Spontaneous Healing book was really instrumental for me in, in, in thinking about the body and health and wellness and diet completely different. And I read that when I was like a, you know, three times a week, fast food guy eating steaks and pork chops on the grill. And I just, it totally changed my way of thinking about the body and and what we put into it and and how we make, help it heal. So those are two books I I commonly recommend to people and you can definitely get bone games. It's it's out there used um, books that are floating around, but um, not to recommend a, a really rare one, but I did recently read actually while I was writing North, I read Michael's book, uh, Stranger in the Woods. And I found it, I, I love reading about off the wall, um, characters mm-hmm. and people that do people that do things that defy, um, limits. And, um, I know it's always hard to understand people who do things, but it, you know, for somebody to be out in the woods for years and years, um, with no human contact, it was, it's a mind boggling thing. So I, I love reading those kind of, as much as I love reading you know, sports books and adventure books, it's, I think sometimes peering into the, the lives of people that do things that are really almost unfathomable um, and, and selectively do that. Um, I mentioned in my book, the whole idea of, you know, selective suffering or elective challenge. Uh, my buddy to me calls it elective challenge where we put ourselves in these really difficult and sometimes painful situations like running along the Appalachian trail or running an ultra marathon or, or even for some people that's running a 10 K or a half marathon. It, nobody's forcing us to do it. We actually choose to do that for fun. And I'm a believer that the human body and mind have this desire to be put in you know, challenging situations. That's how I think we became such a um, amazing species. And the only way we like get to practice that nowadays, it seems like in this world of comfort is to put ourselves in the pain cave, so to speak. So sometimes we have to do those difficult things. And I tell people like, you don't always have to go out on a hard, you know, elective challenge, uh, elective suffering pilgrimage, but, um, it's good to, good to put ourselves in the pain cave once in a while, physically and mentally. Scott, I've so enjoyed this interview. I've learned so much. And I, I, we have a lot of friends that cross over and, and mentors as well. Chris McDougall has been on this show as well, and he speaks the world of you. We ask all of our guests this one question. I asked Chris this question as well. You know, if you could throw any party, where is it? Who's coming? What are we eating? What music is playing? Ooh, wow. Uh, just because I'm a a mountain woods kind of guy. It'd have to be somewhere on a mountain pass. And if I could pick anywhere, it'd probably be like the Himalaya just because those mountains are just, I don't know. I just feel so small and so minuscule um, when I'm, and I've only been there once, but I feel like it'd have to be there. And the music that would be playing, I would say a mash of hip hop, rage against the machine, um, <laughs> You have to throw you'd have to throw some Pearl Jam, Eddie Vedder in there, um, some chanting by Krishna Das, some classical. I mean, I think I, I just like a, a whole bunch of things because I think I'd I'd want people like Gandhi. I'd like people, and I know some people. Some of these people are controversial: Nelson Mandela, Martin Luther King Jr., and then you know somebody like Dostoevsky or. Um, Tolstoy to just throw in some really depressing, uh, it's be a heavy uh, party. I love this. Yeah. Just a heavy party. Um, and, uh, some, I don't know, I'm trying to even think of like athletes that I'd want there, but yeah, I'd have to, yeah, I'd have to think more about the athletes that I would pick, but it sounds like uh, I'd want some, though. yeah, I'd want some deep, deep thinkers. Maybe, 
it, there'd probably be a few philosophers included in there too. I, I love it. Well, it has been such a pleasure, Scott. You know, what's next? Where can people find out more? Well, what's next? Um, dad life's been pretty all, all in, uh, encompassing, but I'm hoping to get back. I'm getting on the road and doing a bunch of events over the summer. Um, I've got this REI tour coming up in August where I'll be at all the flagship stores each weekend. So I'll be going from DC to Bloomington, Minnesota to Seattle and also Denver. And I've got a bunch of events. Actually, this this month I'll be at three different events, including the Cliff Bar Auditorium. And I'm, I've got a, a big round of tour of VegFest in New Jersey. So it's it's kind of a, a quick little hits in between uh, some fun stuff that I'm planning to do with the family. And then hopefully next year, another big adventure. Um, I can't say what it is for sure right now, but Jenny's uh, recovered. I'm recovered mentally and physically enough to be like, okay, I want to do another big adventure run. And uh, so stay tuned for that. And you can you can follow me on Instagram, Facebook, and all those formats and, and keep abreast of what I've been doing. But lately it's been like recalibrating at home and and kind of recovering from the book writing process and being on tour and, and everything else. It's, it's been an amazing experience and um, love meeting everybody and hearing their stories. So it's, it's been a lot of fun now, but it's time to get back to the mountains. Yeah, we're excited to see you on the road. We'll link in the show notes on where to find Scott Jurek at your local REI store. Scott, thank you so much again. This has been awesome. Thank you for having me. Scott, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thanks to the folks at Brooks and REI Co-op for making the introduction to Scott. For more on Scott Jurek, to buy North, to follow him on his book tour, get his first book, Eat and Run, go to Scott Jurek, that's J-U-R-E-K dot com. Scott, you're a total rock star. I'm so happy to know you and grateful for this interview. Listeners, thank you for all the feedback, the last few weeks of shows, your reviews on Apple Podcasts mean a ton. If you want to help this show grow, tell a friend or 10 Write a review on Apple Podcasts. They're hilarious. I'd wish you guys could all email me who you are. And remember, wherever you are, the best adventures often happen when you follow your wildest ideas. See you in two weeks. <laughs>